Welcome back to part four of week one of photo history. In our last video, we um, we left off talking about William Henry Fox Talbot and his calotype process. And we considered how the advantage of the negative positive process as far as reproducibility, um, this was going to feed that appetite of this burgeoning middle class that they had for images of things that uh, were newsworthy or were exotic places that they might like to travel or interesting scientific facts, things like that. Let's take a look at this first image of Talbot's. So here's this negative. They have his notation that says August 1835. He shot it with his, he was still referring to it as a camera obscura, um, this latticed window at his, uh, liste, his uh, estate, excuse me. So this is the negative small you can kind of tell that it's a window um, because we see that regular pattern there but this is a positive print made from that negative so we can see there's a little bit more detail in it but you can also definitely tell that there's not as much as a as a daguerreotype um, it has this soft kind of grainy look to it very different look from a uh, daguerreotype here's the actual windows that he was um, photographing. They're still around at his estate. This is one of the cameras that he used. He would make these. Um, scholars think that some of them may have been made for him, but some of them are really rough, like this one, that he probably made himself, but he put them all over his house in places where he would get good light. And his wife referred to them as his mouse traps and the name kind of stuck. So to this day, these cameras of Talbot's are still referred to as his uh, mousetrap cameras. And you can see on the right side of the lens, there's a little light leak. They're very rough. Here's another of his images from his estate there. It looks like either the same or a similar latticed window. Um, and here's kind of a fun little exercise for you. If you uh, pause the video here, take your cell phone and invert your settings and then look at this image through your cell phone camera with the inverted um, inverted colors and you'll see this as a positive and it's really surprising actually how much more detail hides in this image that you can't quite make out in the negative but as a positive suddenly you can see it um, it's it's a lot of fun actually in 1884 starting in 1884 and then um, proceeding through 1846 Talbot published this book called The Public, uh, Pencil of Nature. It was intended to promote the scientific and practical uses of photography. Uh, that was how he saw it. So let's look at a few of his images from the book. So this, by this point, um, he had perfected his process enough that he could have shorter exposures and record some humans in it. Um, you can see here, it's definitely a very bright sunny day, but even with that, um, this was probably a long enough exposure that there's still a little bit of movement in the human figure. So not the greatest for portraiture yet. It's another image from the book, the haystack, but you can see it still does a pretty good job of, um, rendering the texture in these scenes. You, you can definitely, um, feel the texture of that hay in your mind. This is one of the more famous images from the book. This one's entitled the open door. Uh, and you can see again, uh, despite the limitations of the medium, there's still quite a bit of texture here. You can tell a difference between the texture of the stone versus the texture in the broom. And you can even see a little bit of shadow detail in the background. You can see the windows in way inside the room there. Um, some other important figures as we wrap this up, um, Hippolyte Bayard was yet another Frenchman who invented his own photographic process around the same time as Daguerre. There's debate about whether or not Bayard could have been the first inventor of photography. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's really interesting that so much time goes by and no one can quite crack the code to making an image in a camera obscura and being able to keep it. And then suddenly, at least two 
three, maybe more, um, were working on similar experiments at the same time. Bayard's process was another paper-based process, so he wasn't using metal plates or pewter plates like Niepce. Um, he had light sensitized uh, paper. He was working on this around the same time as Daguerre, and he had considered going public with it, but was discouraged from doing so by the French government. Uh, as it turns out, which he discovered later, uh, the French government official who discouraged him from going public with it already knew about Daguerre's. And so later when Bayard found out about this, he was understandably pretty upset. Um, and afterwards made this portrait of himself, self-portrait as a drowning man, just to express his anger and frustration at possibly being denied the claim to, uh, having invented the first photographic process. Here's another of his images I included just because some of the earlier images that we looked at, they, they captured images, they, but you wouldn't necessarily call them uh, fine art or uh, art with a capital A. And it's understandable. They were more concerned with trying to get their process right. But um, you can see in this shot of Bayard's this beautiful composition when you look at the symmetry of the framing and the way he's using um, the regular rhythm and pattern of these columns and their shadows to guide the eye through the frame. This is a really, really masterful composition. Um, something that you didn't see as often in some of this early work because it was the product of inventors who were trying to perfect a process. Um, but Bayard seems to have had uh, equal amounts of, of um, inventiveness as well as an eye for composition. Another really important one, John Herschel, a British uh, inventor. Many of these figures um, were upper class. They, um, they had enough means that they could pursue these intellectual pursuits and not have to worry about whether they could make a living from it. Um, John Herschel was one of those. Whereas William Henry Fox Talbot, we, we discussed earlier with Daguerre, the French government bought his process. Um, and he was basically, he was kind of taken care of with that. Talbot didn't need the money, but he patented his process and was very concerned with protecting it. He even tried to, uh, extend his claims to advances that other people made and, and tried to claim that his patent covered even um, innovations that other people made. A stark contrast to that is John Herschel, who you may recall his name from earlier. He was the one who discovered that Hypo could stop the darkening of the silver um, after development. So he was the one who came up with the part of the process that both Talbot and Daguerre used to um, stop development and protect the images from, from continuing to darken. This is a huge uh, debt that they owe to him in my mind. Um, and I think it speaks of his generosity that he shared it with them and wasn't concerned with whether he would get credit or make any money from it. After seeing the results of their experiments and, and seeing um, their processes made public, he went back into his laboratory and invented his own photographic process called the cyanotype, which used uh, light sensitive iron salts with a paper negative. Um, this process today actually is the easiest one to do of all of these historic processes we've mentioned so far. Later, I'll share you, with you some experiments that I did um, this past spring with my kids as uh, one of their STEAM activities for, for school. Um, but you can buy this paper, cyanotype paper, pre-coated. Um, you expose it in sunlight and it doesn't require any special developer. You can develop the image out with just water from your sink uh, and then you let the prints air dry. Uh, it's really has an interesting look. Um, but John Herschel uh, was crucial to both of those figures completing their processes. Um, so we may not have gotten to where we are now, or at least not as quickly without John Herschel doing his own work and then sharing it, um, which I think is, is another really interesting part of this whole story. 
Uh, so finally, just to sum up where we've come from so far, um, when we compare the daguerreotype with the cyanotype, some observations here. Um, if we recall, the daguerreotype, because of its extreme detail and sharpness, um, is, seems to really be prized for scientific uses. Um, but there is definitely an, an appetite for using it artistically. Um, but you can see that regardless of the process, people want that detail uh, because they, it, it's much harder to achieve in a painting or drawing. Um, there's a lot fewer people who can do it well, whereas a camera makes this ability to capture these fine details. It makes it more accessible to not everyone, but a lot more people. Speaking of the artistic um, instincts that some people had to want to use the camera in a, in a creative way, um, Talbot thought of his pencil of nature as being an argument for the camera as, as the scientific recorder of accuracy. Um, but referring to his photo, The Open Door, his own mother um, said it, she talked about the, quote, soliloquy of the broom uh, in the photo. So even she is recognizing there, there are aesthetic possibilities for this medium. Um, and one, one other observation with the daguerreotype, your aesthetic controls are the light that you have. So a lot of these um, photographers had studios where they had uh, skylights and lots of windows and they could control the light somewhat with um, curtains and blinds and things to sort of shape the light somewhat. Uh, but they were reliant on lots and lots of daylight. Um, no flashes or studio strobes or anything of that sort had been invented at this point. Their way to control the aesthetics of an image was with light, with how they framed and composed the image, maybe the pose if it was a portrait, clothes or costume or settings. Whereas with the calotype, in addition to those things, you also had the ability to alter the way you process the negative or the print, which could give you more aesthetic possibilities. The same is true today in the darkroom working with um, your gelatin silver paper. Um, there are so many ways you can change the kind of developer, or the dilution that you use it at, how you expose it, what you can control contrast. You can um, tone it in different kinds of chemicals to, to give that black and white image a, a different color cast. And that's just talking about black and white. Um, so you can see that um, you know there's different options available to the photographer depending on whether they choose the daguerreotype or the calotype or later on uh, the cyanotype uh, but that's it for this week's lectures um, the book you'll want to um, check the syllabus it has the readings in there which pages to read the book definitely goes into much more detail about all of these things but i wanted to kind of sketch out um, the high points of all of that stuff, but definitely go back um, and read through that. And that's what you'll be using um, to aid you uh, when you take the quizzes.